for the invitation uh, to give this presentation, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the lunch. I, I did. It was very good. Um, so, as Anne mentioned, my name is V, and I'm a data scientist. Um, I work for a company called Muventive. We are based out of Connecticut on the East Coast uh, in the United States. And we focus on projects on AI, ML, data science, uh, with, and we work with different types of data, images, videos, and, and language. So this specific talk is going to touch a little bit about the, uh, the language aspect. So uh, more specifically, what I'm going to talk about is basically at the intersection of uh, three different areas. Uh, so one of them, uh, you know, I assume that you should be somewhat familiar with because you are attending, after all, an event that's dedicated to process mining. Uh, the two other areas uh, are conversational interfaces and L NLU, which is natural language understanding. And uh, I'm going to give, uh, spend a few slides next to give you some background because I would assume that uh, you know, not all the people in the room have uh, you know, background and uh, knowledge uh, and or exposure to conversational interfaces uh, uh, in the level that I would like to, uh, to discuss. So, uh, so what are conversational interfaces? Uh, so the name is quite self-explanatory. It's all these interfaces that allow you to basically use conversation or back and forth of uh, natural language for different functionality. Either you interact with some product uh, to, to basically able to access that functionality, or you are able to basically retrieve some sort of a content or some document using natural language. So there are all kinds of different, uh, you know, a, a lot of different uh, use cases, right? And one of them, for example, would be maybe a nice robotic, um, you know, uh, uh, ro robot, roving robot here that would give uh, directions, right, to, to the process mining uh, on campus. Um, but in general, uh, three examples for uh, conversational interfaces are uh, chatbots, and I'm assuming that a lot of you might have uh, interacted with chatbots before. In fact, uh, there is a screenshot on the right-hand side uh, of the, of the slide here that basically uh, shows, and I'm happy that you're able to see the text, right? It's, uh, the font is large enough uh, for the screen. So um, I interacted with the bot with, with a pretty uh, neat idea that was developed by a fresh PhD uh, graduate who actually wanted to enable people uh, to access and ask questions about uh, his thesis or dissertation using natural language. So the, there is quite a bit of complexity to language, as you see, like, this is my interaction with him, and the very first question is somewhat a generic question that I would expect that chatbot to answer, like, what is this dissertation about? And there is a little bit of confusion and struggle, right, on the part of that, uh, of that chatbot. And so uh, that, that would allude a little bit to what uh, later I would like to address uh, in more detail. Another example is that of voice interfaces or voice assistants, right? So these are um, basically have become much more, more, much more popular with the emergence of all kinds of voice devices, so, such as Amazon Bot here on the, on the slide here. But there's also uh, you know, availability of other type of uh, you know, devices from big tech like uh, Google Home and so on and so forth. And, and so the major advantage of those voice interfaces is that it allows you to do all kinds of things, like turn on and off lights in your house, or maybe you know, uh, do all kinds of things while you are hands-free. For example, you know, set timers while you're cooking, or you know, ask uh, you know, the weather in a certain city, or maybe even switch radio stations while you're driving without uh, right, getting distracted. So there are a whole lot of different applications for that. And finally, the other example that I'm going to give is not very, um, it's, it's not not very popular or not very common, uh, a commonly you know, accepted example of uh, conversational interfaces by the public, but nonetheless, cognitive search engines, which are search engines that allow you to basically uh, retrieve different content uh, using natural language. And these are very um, popular with different enterprises, right, that they can empower their employees to efficiently retrieve uh, things related to their uh, right, internal knowledge bases and so on. So those are all examples of, uh, of uh, right, conversational interfaces. And so uh, this presentation is going to be about actual actionable insights. I, I know a lot of people were, uh, were talking about different types of insights, different type of discovery, but from the point of view of conversational interface designers. So what are people who build or design conversational interfaces? And by the way, it, it's actually becoming a real profession these days. There is a company not far from here uh, in Amsterdam that has classes that I think you pay about $1,000 or 1,000 euros, and you, become, you can become a certified uh, conversational 
conversational designer. And what it means is that it's basically a very multidisciplinary class that exposes you to uh, different elements, from writing to user to UI UX to some, some knowledge of natural language processing, some AI. Uh, and things along those lines, right? And that actually mirrors a lot of the um, teams in bigger organizations where you have a product manager, you have um, a, a UI UX designer, you have a, you know, a developer with more of a you know, deep technical skills that they all come together and they develop those conversational interfaces. And the major, um, the major challenge with conversational interfaces is that uh, again, the, the, um, is the language, right? Language is very complex, in particular if you have a, a large heterogeneous user base, right? So different people use different uh, language to mean the same thing, and in, in fact, sometimes like, the same person uses different words, terms, or expressions, right, to mean uh, exactly the same thing. And that's where the, the, the problem kind of arises, right? Where your, your design is different than the, ac the actual um, interaction of your user, of your users with the interface. And that's uh, where I think that uh, you know, process discovery or process mining in general could be, uh, could be very useful. And uh, obviously, because it also necessitates, so you need to monitor and look at different KPIs, you need to explore data, and you need constant refinement, right? So, uh, so that's why um, I'm going to talk about process mining, but I'll still need to give you a little bit more background uh, into conversational interfaces before going uh, deeper into that. And we are already, I guess, uh, how much is it? 10, 10 minutes in it, and we still didn't say a word about process mining. So just bear with me a little bit. Um, so what are basically common architectures for, for conversational interfaces? So when, when you tell a person to build a conversational interface, there are certain modules or components that uh, are available or that people have been thinking about uh, implementing such interfaces. So the first one is basically, if you have a voice assistant, you have the speech-to-text uh, component, right? Takes the speech and converts it to, uh, to text, some sort of a transcript or some, what we call also a user utterance. Right? And that is not necessary in the case of uh, chatbots or cognitive search engine. Then there is the second violin of this talk, which is the natural language understanding module. It comes uh, second to process mining. And this is a very important key module here. What really it does is take that user utterance and basically extracts meaningful representation out of it. And we are going to see in just a little bit what that actually means. Um, but then it... Then there is another one <laughs> that it passes on uh, the representation to, which is the... Um, hmm. Interesting. So there is, there is another component called dialogue management. And the dialogue management takes the representation from the natural language understanding uh, component, right? And that's where all the magic happens. So if the user asks a question about the uh, weather in a specific city, thank you, um, and it basically retrieves that uh, data that needs to be, um, you know, that needs to be uh, returned to the user as an answer and also returns some sort of representation to a component called natural language generation, which the name again is self-explanatory, which takes that representation and basically returns a, a natural language to the user that they can actually understand. And then, you know, obviously if you have a voice interface, you have a text-to-speech uh, synthesizer on top of it. So that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, an overview of how the, the, the stack or the, the architecture of our conversational interfaces work. And uh, so basically, uh, an impo another important point about the NLU is that it is, it's so important that it has become commoditized. What it means is that there's a lot of different offerings on the market for those NLU components. So we are talking about things like, uh, you know, big tech that offers Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And in fact, actually, the implementation that I'm going to talk about here uh, uses uh, Lewis uh, by Microsoft. Lewis is a language understanding intelligence service. It's an NLU module uh, with, with a lot of features that you might be able to, you know, you probably should look at this uh, after, you know, at some point. And um, uh, this, uh, this uh, is part of cognitive, the cognitive services offering of Microsoft. There is also like uh, open source, pretty good actually open source alternatives that are pretty robust and strong as well. And so diving a little bit deeper into a 
uh, natural language understanding concepts, basically just the, the, the bare bones here. Um, and I'm going to use a running example from a financial institution company that uh, wants to create a customer support chatbot so that it answers the questions that user may have about uh, you know, their, their personal accounts or maybe other services that the financial institute may offer. Um, so again, we have the input right, to the natural language understanding component. That is uh, basically the user utterance. Then you have the notion of entities, which are basically representations of real-world objects or concepts. So in this case, it's a balance or a checking account. And finally, you have the notion of an intent, which is kind of a bucket or a category to which, um, the, uh, to which user, uh, in, uh, user utterances can actually fall. Right? So in this case, the designer decided to uh, basically bucket all the questions that are uh, related to personal accounts intent into its own bucket and uh, basically um, you know, output that for that specific utterance. So another example for other services. So here is a question about mortgages. So mortgages is the entity here. And we have an intent, which is the other services intent, which is a pretty generic, right? And uh, kind of almost a catch-all uh, type of intent. In general, if you want to build uh, meaningful uh, you know, conversational interfaces, you would need um, maybe uh, tens or hundreds of different types of entities and intents. Um, and uh, another, type, another intent that you would probably, another types of intents you would probably want to define uh, as a designer would be something that if the user, not only type of questions, but if the user, for example, provides you some positive or negative feedback, you want to capture that. Or if a uh, user uh, basically starts a conversation or end a conversation in a, in a way that is uh, easy to, to basically um, understand from the user utterance, you also want to label that as its own user utterance. And so the way that uh, basically designers interact with uh, those NLU modules or use them is that uh, NLU, NLU modules is that, sorry, there's module and model, uh, is that uh, basically those NLU um, modules have machine learning algorithms uh, that basically uh, identify the, the, the entities and classify those intents. So the way that you need to uh, work with that is that you need to provide it, it's supervised machine learning, you need to provide examples for the possible user utterances as well as you know, annotate your entities and uh, basically uh, label the intents, right? So you need to be able to provide enough coverage, uh, so quite a, you know, a few examples so that uh, you, know, you have a diverse set of, uh, a diverse data set for the NLU module to learn from. And so once you, once you do that, you can actually feed it, and this is a screenshot from an older version of Lewis, but it's still pretty much the same around this uh, functionality. You basically feed that into the natural language uh, understanding module. And you typically want to divide the, you know, your data set to training and to test set, train on the train set, and then basically feed the NLU uh, component all those um, examples that they uh, didn't see before, right? So you can basically measure the performance. And then, uh, you know, and, and then you need to rinse and repeat after you are basically pretty much happy, right, with, uh, with what the, um, the NLU model outputs on the or the entities and the intents that the, the NLU model actually outputs on, the, on your test set. And so going forward, I'm actually going to focus on intents. Uh, entities are a little bit more complex, and uh, you know, feel free to uh, catch me after the talk uh, if you would like to have some uh, additional uh, discussion about that. And so once you train, once the designer basically finishes to train the, the model, it basically, you basically publish it. And what it does, it gives you an API. You can then, you can then feed the new, hopefully new user utterances, uh, and then get the results that the you know, NLU model spits out. Right? So in this case, this is the output of Lewis. So in this slide, there are two interesting things to note. One of them is that in addition to the intents, it also gives you confidence score. So it's a good ability to basically see whether how conf confused your NLU model is about different things. So for example, uh, about intent classification in this case. So for example, if you have a big uh, difference between you know, the other services intent and the personal accounts intent, it means that it's pretty confident that this is um, that this, this classification is pretty, uh, it's pretty useful. In cases that you have some uh, minor differences, you might need to do some sort of disambiguation. For example, a workaround would be pause a clarification question for a user. 
Uh, the other thing to note here is the non-intent, non right? So we didn't uh, really train specifically for this non-intent, but this is a default intent catch-all. So for example, if you develop a customer support chatbot, right, for um, a financial institution and someone asks you what's for dinner tonight, right, you want to gracefully be able to answer that. So the default intent uh, is uh, added automatically by Lewis, but you also can train it such that you can, and that's kind of uh, uh, some of the gotchas of those NLU modules, because uh, it's very tough to get that uh, default intent right, albeit it's, it's, it's important to know that it's, it's there. And so finally, you know, we arrive at the step where we can talk about process mining. So really, um, if you model the conversations as sequences of only the user, user utterances, right, and you have, uh, you have the conversation uh, ID and you have the intent, you already right, guess the story that, you know, the case ID would be the conversation ID and the uh, intent would be the activity ID, right? So this allows you to basically uh, use your favorite, uh, you know, process miner to derive some, some uh, insights. And in this case, I'm going to talk about uh, three actionable insights that are useful for conversational uh, interface designers. There are plenty of different, uh, you know, um, examples, uh, uh, but that's what uh, also I had the time uh, to discuss. So one of them is the, uh, some people refer to it uh, potentially the case completeness, right? Or what conversational interface designers would be interested to know if there are any abandonment, right, in their conversations, whether the user provided a negative feedback and then just disappeared, or maybe there was some other type of, uh, you know, intent or other type of user utterances that he said, and he didn't basically say goodbye or basically finish the conversation in a clean way, right? So that's, uh, that's one example that uh, you can get straight out of basically mapping the process map into conversational flows, right? And uh, the other thing is obviously, you know, you can get all kinds of different great summary information. People mentioned visualization, right? Happy paths and things along those lines are all very, very useful uh, to, um, to designers. Another thing that the designers are very interested in, and it depends actually on the use case, because not all, conversation, all, not all conversational interfaces are basically created equal. So if you're looking at a customer support conversational uh, interface, right, you would want to give the users the, the answer as quickly as possible. So you, do, you would want your conversation to be biased towards like very... Um, short duration, right, and very short conversations. If you are actually designing a conversational interface, say, as part of a marketing campaign or uh, some advertisement, say, for a movie, right, and you want to keep the user engaged, right, in a conversation, to ask about characters, about scenes, about... Um, about actors and so on, and you want, uh, you know, in, in the hope that it would translate eventually to people uh, purchasing merchandise about the movie if they already saw it, or maybe it will uh, convince people to go and see the movie. Um, so that, th those are things that uh, this specific view, right, about uh, cases gives you um, uh, good indication about uh, those things. So you can basically use, you know, filters and uh, variants, right, to drill through and uh, try to see, you know, depending on what the case is, what the, the case, not the, the case in the process mining sense, but what your interface that you're trying to develop, you can basically drill and see, you know, what were your successes, what were your failures, and you can start to learn from it uh, using those tools straight out of the box. Um, and uh, it also has a very good, uh, you know, it, it also allows you to see the, the transcripts in a, in a, you need to go back to the transcripts uh, at the end. So you also need to look at that as part of that, uh, say, troubleshooting or basically mining of what uh, went wrong with your conversational interface. The last uh, actionable insight I want to talk about is basically frequency of intents. So the frequency of intents, uh, sometimes it could be uh, to have an intent that is very frequent could be very good. For example, if there is an intent that reflects uh, positive feedback, that's a good thing. However, um, if you have uh, intents that are, for example, like the non-intent, right, that is, not, is the default intent, or maybe you have uh, intents that are kind of generic, like the other services intent that you thought initially that the users might not ask a more refined question about it, you can basically figure out from the, from the frequency um, and start to explore you know, why that is the case and if you know, there are certain intents that exert that type of behavior. So uh, I'm sorry that I took a little bit more time than I should have, but uh, most of the material that I covered in this uh, talk 
is available online in a, you know, in a form of a Microsoft uh, magazine article that I published uh, late last year. And you can also download the uh, data set, the toy data set that I used for this presentation. And uh, you know, if you have additional questions, here is my email, and I'll be happy to answer. Uh, take some questions now, if uh, time permits. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you. From the audience, and I start off with one question, and then the rest can be discussed further in the break. So my question to you would be, so this is for the uh, conversational interface designer. Do you see the designer doing the cross-mining analysis themselves? They're already doing yeah. some data analytics, things like yes, that? Yes, I think that, that, that that's a good question. So I think there are two things here. Like, so again, like, I think conversational interface designers in general, they are like uh, cross-functional. So if you, are, you can give Disco right, and very intuitive tools to people like in product management, and people who are less technically savvy, they can already like, start to mine all those, uh, you know, start mining different KPIs on their own. Uh, for things that are more, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of different things that might require additional layers of intelligence and machine learning on top of the process mining. And so things like uh, the project that uh, Professor um, um, van der Alst started, right, the PM for PI is a good starting point for that, for example. So. Okay, thank you. One question from the audience. Who, who wants to go? There. Yes. Can you give a microphone to the... Thanks for that fascinating presentation. Do you have um, any use cases where you use process mining to discover missing um, conversations. So one of the problems we have currently with, um, is finding the scope of ways people that ask the diff same question. Um, do you, do, can, have you used process mining to so, find so that So yes, so, um, so yeah, so basically you can use different tools on, on top of front, so you can use so you can use different tools for clustering uh, in addition to what currently exists, say in the toolkit, to do a clustering across multiple dimensions. So um, so yeah, there is a lot of you know like uh, personalization and other type of things. This is just the bare the bare bonds, right? But if you either model some of these things as attributes, right, or e either you are also um, doing you know. There are some examples that I am I'm not at liberty to talk, talk about, but you can actually add additional layers right on top of the process mining to be able to do like a more refined clustering. Okay, let's let's thank Svi again. Thank you very much.